Um, let's go ahead and start the uh, May 5th. Um, well, Holy Roxbury uh, School Board meeting at 6.32. Um, let's do roll quickly. Uh, Amanda? Here. Anakit? Here. Kristen? Here. Jill? Here. Yeah. Here. Jerry? Here. Andrew? Here. And Emma said she was probably not going to join until a little after seven. Um, uh, public comment. Uh, the way we do this is um, if you can, please raise your hand in the, uh, on the raise hand function in the participants bar. Um, if you have trouble navigating that, you can just raise your hand visually on the screen. Um, or uh, if that fails, just shout out uh, to the cell phone and, and shout out. But right now it looks like uh, Julia um, has raised her hand and please uh, announce yourself for the uh, Orca Media feed. Uh, but go ahead, Julia. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Julia Shafitz. I'm a Montpelier resident and parent of a student in this district and also um, I'm a social worker in private practice um, and I'm reading a letter to you that is um, signed by 20 local um, mental health practitioners. So dear Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools directors and Superintendent Bonesdale, we are a group of mental health providers that serve the students and families in your district. Access to mental health resources is always a challenge in this area at all levels of mental health care from outpatient to intensive hospitalization. We hear from our clients, from school staff and from others in the community that it is difficult to find providers with openings for individual or family therapy. Often people wait for services and during the wait, the unmet need becomes exas exacerbated. Then when a client, especially a child is in crisis and has a higher level of need, whether for intensive outpatient services or inpatient stays, there's often a long wait for those services to begin or a high threshold of need in order to qualify. VT Digger has reported on this crisis at the hospital level. Our mental health ecosystem simply does not have the resources to truly and fully meet the mental health needs of our community. I apologize that I, there's a, <laughs> I think there's a paragraph that got cut off in the, uh, in the, in the group editing of this. <laughs> this is about the ESSER funding. <laughs> to prime your 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 pumps in terms of thinking and I'll, when I send it to you I'll make sure that paragraph gets added back in um, uh, when this is our reality we all suffer we also know that those members of our community who are pushed to the margins because of their identities or realities because they are BIPOC LGBTQIA neurodivergent poor or have disabilities are likely to suffer the most we see this suffering play out daily as we do our work it is real and true in our community what this looks like in reality is, here's a few examples, a teenager struggling with intense anxiety that compels them to avoid many of the things that make their life rich, including school. Through hard work with an individual therapist, they finally express willingness to try intensive outpatient services and begin the intake process, which requires their participation. They found out that they then have to wait six weeks for the program to begin, and in that time, they lose their willingness to access the program. Another example is a parent with a preteen child is noticing an increase in depressive symptoms and would like their child to see a therapist. They get a list of names to call and try calling five different therapists. None have openings and the child ends up waiting for therapy. In the meantime, their depressive symptoms continue to escalate and the child begins to rely on self-harming behaviors for self-regulation. A local therapist who serves teens and has a focus on LGBTQIA population says, I have been re receiving new client requests almost daily from folks trying to find support who I do not have space for. Many are giving up and not finding the support they need. A local mental health counselor who specializes in treating adolescents has always received many more calls and referrals than she can accommodate. She used to help people find other counselors with openings, but in the past year, she's had to change her outgoing message to state that she can't accept new clients simply to cut down on the number of people she had to call back. The volume became unmanageable. 
She does still end up helping friends and acquaintances to try to find counselors with openings, and it is increasingly challenging. We know that the skilled providers who are here serving our community, both in private practice and it's in agencies, deeply care about the individuals they serve and the community we all belong to. We simply don't have the resources we need in our ecosystem to meet all of those needs. You have the opportunity as a school district to make an investment in our mental health resources. We ask that you use a significant portion of the ESSER funds available to the district to invest in both directly addressing the mental health needs of students and also in strengthening the mental health infrastructure that supports students and their families. We encourage you to address this problem creatively. Psychological wellness is a broad category and the efforts that could support greater wellness in our community must be diverse beyond simply increasing the presence of clinical care. Some examples of programs we would love to see in our community include, but are not limited to, mentoring programs that connect BIPOC students, students, LGBTQIA students, and students with disabilities or who are neuro neurodivergent with others who have similar experiences. More robust, robust assessment and referral processes that build on the project that has already been piloted at MRPS. Extensive training for all adults in MRPS schools on the dynamics of trauma that includes recognizing symptoms and developing strategies to address the symptoms as they occur in the classroom and school community. Training should help adults become supporters of those healing and know how to foster a felt sense of safety and connection for all students. Peer support groups and networks among caregivers, supported recreational activities staffed by trauma and mental health informed staff. It is crucial that the creation of such programs and initiatives be well-funded so that we take the time and energy to build them in ways that effectively meet and actively center the needs of students, especially those who are BIPOC, LGBTQIA, neurodivergence, neurodivergent, experience economic hardship or have disabilities. With strong funding up front, such initiatives can have ripple effects into the future of our community, its culture and resources. We implore you to use this opportunity to shape our mental health ecosystem toward wellness for all students. Sincerely, 20 local providers. I will um, send you this uh, uh, copy of this letter in your emails and thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, Julia. Do we have anyone else who would like to speak during public comment? Jim, Sarah's raising her hand. Oh, Sarah, go ahead. Looks like you're muted. Sorry, I just realized that. Um, <clears throat> I didn't expect that I would be coming after Julia and, and the letter when um, Amanda asked me if I could speak, but I think it actually is very good timing um, because I can actually give you an example of what she's talking about in my family. Um, so uh, Amanda, uh, Amanda approached me about speaking tonight on equity issues as you've gotten this funding, although I didn't know at the time it was about the, about the funding, but really wanting to talk about equity issues. Hold on, I have an annoying dog. Um, and, um, and, and so I, I, want, um, I wanted to speak about equity in specific, specifically to people who have intellectual disabilities and are neurodivergent and how um, our district has to do a better job meeting their needs. And with this funding, it could be possible that this could happen. And by talking about it, I'd actually like to give the example of my son. Um, my children grew up in this district and we've had um, seen lots of changes of faces um, in us, the director of special ed or special services, principals, guidance counselors. And with those rotating doors, sometimes history is also lost. Um, and I say this because um, after the summer with the pandemic, having a child with an intellectual disability, I saw how important inclusive schooling and education is. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm off script. Script. So you have to bear with me. Um, I have my son who has an intellectual disability is 17, and he's um, a junior at Montpelier High School. Um, the pandemic hit him hard mainly because he didn't have the skills, the, uh, the processing speed. And for people who might not be familiar with processing speed, it's just being able to keep up and keep at that same pace as other people. 
um, who don't have an intellectual disability or a learning disability. Um, so the online communication is challenging. It's challenging to keep up um, conversations, being able to even write a text because they might not know how to spell and understand the technology to use audio stuff um, or, or just have the skills to really keep this stuff going. And so my son plummeted into a severe depression. Um, I went to Renee who was incredibly uh, supportive and said, we gotta do something for my son. This is not gonna work. Um, and he also needs life skills. Like he does not have a clue how to live in this world. And we were, we were, I was also talking to the head of special ed and their idea of, the idea that was presented to me for life skill development was an online program. Um, now, I'm a, I'm a social worker. I'm also an educator and I've worked with children with um, learning challenges um, from different cultures, from different racial groups um, for 30 years. And I've come to believe a lot of the same um, thoughts as um, Lev Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist. And, and there's three points I wanna say that he talks about, um, he makes or, 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 or quotes from him. What a child is able to do in collaboration today, he'll be able to do independently tomorrow. Through others, we become ourselves. By giving our students practice in talking with others, we give them frames for thinking on their own. We learn collecti collectively, we learn in groups. That's how we foster, that's how we, we become who we are and how we can become successful adults. Montpelier does not have a life skills program for the most needy students. We need that. Our um, being told as a parent who kind of knows a little bit about kids um, that we're gonna do an online program and that's all we can do because we just don't have the capacity and we don't have the students to me is, is not acceptable. And it's not acceptable because I'm gonna go back to circling to going through all of the special ed directors. I've been in the school district for 15 years, if I think about when my daughter started. And I've seen the kids drop out over and over again, going to Pachan, being homeschools, people leaving because their kids could not get the, their needs met in this school district. In Montpelier High School, elementary school, middle school, parents are afraid to have their kids here because their kids' needs are not getting met. I didn't have a choice. We did not, both my, my husband and I work full time. We have three special need kids. We don't have the economic resources to go and use private schools or literally, honestly, to move. Um, and so we were stuck with, our, with Montpelier schools, which sounds crazy because we're a wonderful school district. But I felt stuck in the school district, district and having to endure it for my son. And he has not gotten his needs met. I, he should be educated till age 22 in the school district. But what the school district is offering my son is unconscionable. To sit in front of a computer and learn life skills, I, I don't think that's acceptable. And so I'm taking my son out of the school district and we're going to a program. He still needs educational resources, but to get the program he needs, I have to actually have him graduate from this school. So he still needs help with reading. He still needs help with math. He still needs to social skills development so he knows when he's being conned and when people are, are being racist towards him because he's African-American and he can't always pick up on those things. He needs those skills and, and I'm having to take him out so that he can get those things. I'm saying this not for my son at this point anymore, but you have this opportunity to change things and be a truly inclusive school. And in school, Inclusive school means meeting students where they're at, at their level. Children who are differing in abilities, and I'm talking about significant disabilities, they need to feel a part of the group. They need to be able to be in a, in a gym class where they can keep up. When you have difficulties with gross motor skills, you don't wanna be doing you know, weight lifting with, lifting with a guy over there who can just go like this, because your body can't. Your body's going, wait, what can I do? How do I do it? Oh yeah, that's, 
and like that. And you look over at everybody else who can move much faster than you. How does that feel? So then kids get anxious about it and stop, act, stop moving their body. They stop participating in classes because by the time the teacher asks the question, they might have forgotten what the question was when they get to the answer. And especially if, with interruptions. An inclusive program means have, having classes that are hands-on learning where everyone has a part and feels important. The classes at Montpelier High School where my son used to feel important, almost all of them got camp, cut. We're talking about cooking to learn. Um, one class we were so excited about, it didn't even get to it. And it was like doing Lego robotics, something he could do got cut. Um, there was 20th century where it was social learning and collective learning. He thrived in that class, it got cut. But you know what doesn't get cut? AP classes, Latin doesn't get cut. And I think about it, you can learn Latin on a computer much better than my son can learn independent living skills on a computer, but yet that's what I've been given. And so I'm saying this and I'll stop now because I could go on for about two more hours about this <laughs> once the dam is broke, but we need to actually do something for these kids. I, my son's not gonna fall through the cracks because of me. I'm his, I'm a bear of a mom and I'm not gonna let anything bad happen to my son as long as I'm alive. But what about those kids who don't have me, who don't have a mama like me or a papa like me? What's gonna happen to them? And they're in this district too and they deserve a chance to have a successful life. And we have to do something about it. This school district has to do something for those kids. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, anyone else want to speak? Great. Um, thank you. Now, moving on to the consent agenda. Um, I believe Amanda wants to uh, talk about the uh, piece on authorizing the superintendent to accept, administer external grants and funds. Um, and Amanda, do you want to make a motion to approve the consent agenda with that item pulled for discussion first? We need to pull something else, Jim, too. Okay. Um, the uh, third quarter financial report, the finance committee hasn't met on it, so we can't approve it. Okay, so we'll... that's going to be we, the finance. It, we just got that in the past week, and um, the finance committee couldn't ha hold a quorum when we have two, um, two board meetings and two retreats in a month, and just getting it with that kind of turnaround when we had some other things going on. So, I'm going to do it. I understand. So, we'll, we'll kick that to the uh... Was it 19th? Uh, June 2nd is when we're going to meet on that. Okay. So pull that to June 2nd. Yeah. Um, so do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with those two items pulled? One for consideration at a later meeting, the other just for discussion before we vote on it? So moved. Um, do I have a second? I second. Um, any discussion? Um, Amanda? Not a, oh, I, I always get confused about this part, sorry. <laughs> Can I just thank Sarah before we move in, just because I, I feel like we just kind of moved on and she just gave us all these words and I just wanna thank Sarah and Julia for coming here today and speaking your truths and sharing with us. And um, I really appreciate you. Thank you. And so now for the consent agenda. Um, so is that the, now, sorry, I am still playing, uh, uh, trying to understand this consent agenda. So is the discussion now <laughs> happening? Now I'm gonna ask uh, the question that I have. <laughs> yeah, no, and thank you for acknowledging uh, Sarah Julia's uh, uh, very moving words and stories. Um, uh, we had discussion period, no one said anything, so um, now we're just moving to vote. 
So we're we're <laughs> voting on the consent agenda minus, minus the financial report and minus the authorization uh, for the superintendent to accept and administer the grant funds. And we'll talk about that after approving the rest of the consent agenda. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so is that a is that a yes? Your your top of my screen. All right, perfect. Annika. Hi. Uh, Kristen. Hi. Jill. Hi. Mia. Hi. Jerry. Hi. Andrew. Hi. And I think that's everyone. Thank you. Um, so let's move on to discussing the uh, superintendent uh, accepted minister external grants and funds. Um, Amano, I want to just turn it over to you because I believe you just have a question or wants a clarification on what that is. Oh yeah, I just wanted to know what that was about. It is something that happens yearly that uh, we're required to do for grants because the Administration is the one who writes the federal grants and who submits them. So it's just basically saying that you recognize that we do that work. Any any questions or further comments? Great. Do I have a motion to approve the authorization of the superintendent to accept and administer external grants and funds? I'll move. Sorry, the, does that include the ESSER funds and all the all the all of that, or is that a different thing? Includes all federal grant money. Yes. So it is. So does this mean that we have no saying on the ESSER funds or the federal grants and all of those? No, it just means that we you're authorizing us to put the grant application in and to spend the money. Okay. When it comes. Okay, for that clarification. With regard to any specific, with, with regard to something like ESSER or, you know, something similar to that, we can, I mean, we, we work with the administration to put in place a structure to weigh in on these types of things. So um, I imagine we're going to be talking about that over the course of the next month or two. Thanks yeah, for that no. clarification. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, any further discussion? Okay, let's move to a vote. Um, Amanda? Aye. Annika? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Jill? Aye. Yeah. Hi. Sherry? Hi. And Andrew? Hi. Great. Thank you. Um, next is the learning focus, the presentation on the CIP uh, with our principals and curriculum director. Um, so I will uh, turn it over to Libby to kick it off. and. Yep. Um, Thank everyone in advance for making time to do this tonight. Pull it up. There we go. So, um, first of all, we were we did we weren't had a dry run through this afternoon um, in our leadership team meeting of this presentation, and when we finished, we all just kind of looked at each other um, because uh, we we're pretty impressed with our work this year. I think as the board listens to the, these amazing principals and director of curriculum speak, just at, at the end of every sentence that they say something they've done, just put at the end at, in a pandemic, just put that at the end of every sentence, because the work that has happened in this district, despite the fact that every adult coming into this school school year did not know what was going to happen, were terrified, quite honestly, of many things that could happen. Um, and had so many unknowns. And the group that's here tonight were exhausted already 
for the massive amount of work that had to be gone, going, gone, going into the year just to get it kicked off is just amazingly impressive. And these principals and uh, Mike included in that group are just amazing people and the district is really lucky to have them. I do wanna say that Ryan Harity with his new superintendency uh, will be leaving us. So this may be his last board meeting with the board, um, but, and we're gonna miss Ryan very much, but we will be looking for his success over in the Stowe Morrisville area. Uh, and I also want to say that these principals represent the absolutely fantastic staff of Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. It is Teacher Appreciation Week this week, and uh, we have to make sure that they represent the the people who are doing a lot of the a lot of the nitty gritty work in the background. So, with that said, Mike, you want to get started? Sure thing. Uh, so, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something called a comprehensive needs assessment. There are two parts of the AOE that require this activity each year. That's the School Quality Assurance Team and the Consolidated Federal Programming Team, which is our grants, our federal grants, uh, Title I through IV. Um, and the, on the right-hand side, you can see what goes into a comprehensive needs assessment. It's actually a very thorough process. Um, and this is conducted throughout the year at various levels of the school community. Um, and we go through and we look at our data, we look for trends, we look for patterns, and we talk about how we're going to handle those and move forward with some goal setting and some really thoughtful considerations around what are the things that are causing this data, what are the things that are feeding into this data, and how can we support students better. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. The board has seen this graphic before. It's our four focus areas um, that we have uh, formalized essential learning, uh, which you, you'll hear a little bit about tonight. Collaborative practices and collective responsibilities for every child, uh, designing systems of support that have evidence that work and uh, high quality instruction. So this is just the background for all the work and the principals as they're sharing some of the work this year and their goals are all connected to this uh, diagram here. Ryan, you're up. All right, hi everyone. Uh, good to see you all. So, uh, you know, our presentation tonight first uh, just is a really uh, high level presentation. So we're not really digging into a lot of details. I would have liked to present, you know, probably 45 slides, but Libby didn't let me. Um, no, just kidding. I, but I have so much uh, excitement and things that, that I like to share about our school and the work that the educators in our building are doing. So today, just to preface the slides that I share, they're really just high, high level, um, big picture type information. So we had three big goals this year. Our first goal was to focus on the health of our students, staff, and families. That was really walking into a year where we're in the midst of a global pandemic and thinking about what was the most important thing. And really it started with making sure that our students, our staff, our families felt safe about students coming back to school. And so that was uh, our first priority. The second goal was, uh, you know, if, if we were gonna be in the school and we were fortunate enough to be in the classrooms and we were gonna maintain our commitment to a rigorous curriculum, and ensuring that we were meeting the needs of all of our students. So that was our second goal. So how do we do that in the middle of uh, COVID? And then our third one was to be flexible and responsive to the needs of our students and families. So we had assumed that things would be coming up. We had some information that came uh, to us in the spring and some data that we collected that was telling us a lot about our students and where they were. And so we wanted to make sure that coming into the school year, we were ready to just be flexible and respond to whatever came our way, whether that was us being in person the whole year or whether that was us uh, having to go remote or back and forth, whatever we had to do. We wanted to make sure we were ready. So that's where we started. I'm ready for the next slide. So our first goal was tied to health and safety. So what we did is we designed a reentry plan. So we worked with our site council and our leadership team at the school level to really think about how do we bring students back to school in a safe way. And we adopted what Denmark did first, which was a pod model. And that worked really great for our kids. And 
Um, I'll talk a little bit more about why we ended up selecting the pod model in my next slide, but um, we ended up doing the pod model. We had weekly meetings with our leadership team and our school nurse. We had new cleaning protocols, furniture uh, was purchased. We had air filtration uh, systems cleaned out and installed in the classrooms. And really it was a, a huge district-wide team effort to make all that happen before kids came back. And then we designed the ticket system to make sure that we are going through uh, you know, something that was able to health screen our students before they come to school every day and keep front and center what those guidelines were. Uh, and then we designed a COVID handbook for all of our staff to make sure that they were really aware of all the protocols and things and how everything had changed. So those were just some of the basic things that we did on our first goal. And then throughout the year, we did staff trainings, refreshers. And when we experienced a cluster of COVID cases in our school, we we held individual meetings with every teacher and every educator within our building, just to find out, you know, what are we doing well? What can we be doing better? Where are you at right now? Just to, just to check in with all of our staff. So that, those are some of the action steps we took this year in our first goal. Oh, I think we skipped a slide. If we could back up one. So our second goal was tied to that high quality instruction in every classroom. So here, you know, first was making sure that we were in person or that we had a, a great virtual option. And so we were able to do that. Um, we were able to maintain our math menu professional development work. So that was something we've been really committed to over the past few years on really focusing on math and improving math. And we were able to do that virtually with Christian Cordemont, our math consultant. Uh, I want to give a lot of kudos to, to Mike Berry here on this too, because Mike did something that a lot of districts don't do when thinking about sustaining professional development. And he helped us create a way to bring in new teachers that hadn't experienced any of the professional development we had already done the past year, the past two years. And so our new teachers walked into a, a math menu boot camp where they were caught up on everything that we had missed the prior couple of years. So that's where a lot of districts kind of fall down sometimes is we do things and then the next year we have all these new people that come into the building and how are we bringing those people up to speed? And so it's really great that we have a sustainable model around the math menu piece. Uh, our collaborative team focus has stayed strong. We did a literacy audit this year and looked at all of our literacy instruction building wide. Um, we did a a lot of classroom observations this year and really we're looking at database feedback for our teachers. And then several grades worked on their English language arts priority standards. And you know we're really proud that we've been able to maintain an equity focus this year. So that's something that you know we weren't, um, at the beginning of the year we were saying, are we gonna be able to keep a lot of this work going and a lot of things that we are excited about. And especially our, our first grade and our third grade team they participated in during our professional development days, they were able to work on some really amazing units tied to equity and really um, improve some of the curriculum that they had been focused on. So that was something we were able to maintain. And finally, we did our, our work with the University of Vermont, Vermont this year, and we're in our second year of co-teaching. So what that's done is really just improve the quality of uh, education that our students that receive special education services uh, have in the classroom. And then our third goal is tied to the social emotional piece. And so our data in the spring really told us that a lot of our students were, uh, had concerns around internalizing behaviors. So the internalizing behaviors is uh, students that are experiencing anxiousness or nervousness or students that were concerned and worried. And so we were you know, obviously feeling like we needed to target that throughout the year. And so what we've done with that is we've had embedded classroom lessons that our guidance counselor and social workers have focused on. We've had in-class observations where we've been working, where there's particular students that are struggling. We've been going into the classroom and helping students and helping teachers devise uh, more intensive plans. Um, our pod model has really provided us with a lot of support for students because there's two trusting adults in every classroom. And we've had our teams work uh, to really look at that social emotional data and put a lot of priority on it. We've had Mary Bechtel, our uh, district social emotional learning coordinator, and also Kayla, who has been a, a new behavior specialist that we added this year. So they've been able to work with our teams to really focus on looking at data and improving intervention plans for students that are struggling with behavior. Um, also, we've been working with Joelle Van Lent, who is a psychologist around uh, staff resilience this year. 
recognizing that if our, our teachers feel safe and our teachers feel supported, that that would translate directly to kids. And then finally, we've been working on a universal standards for academic and social emotional learning instruction. So really tying into what are the most important things that we want students to be able to learn in each grade and being able to be really clear about that when it comes to the social emotional piece as well as the academic piece. So that's some of the work that we've done. Um, and our data has really reinforced that, that uh, these systems have been working. This year, we've had a 71% decrease in office calls, a 44% decrease in staff absences, 30% decrease in our EST referrals, which is our educational support team. So that's when a student is struggling, but um, it's, a, it's a preventative process before a teacher or a, a family would request a special education evaluation. So it's one step prior to that. And so we've had a decrease there. Uh, we've had a 57% decrease in special ed referrals um, and then playground and uh, playground incidents have gone way down and uh, classroom behavior incidents have gone way down. Um, academically, one really exciting thing for us was our first grade students. 100% uh, of our students have reached the benchmark for letter ID, which is a very critical component of early literacy instruction. And so that's something that uh, we just wanted to, to celebrate because it's, it's rare that you hit 100%. So every single student in the grade. So. That's what I have um, for next year. Our focus is we're, we're going to tie in some data pieces around our math work. So we want to really push a little bit on making sure that our math data is showing the work that we've done around professional development there. Um, we're looking to decrease concerning internalizing behaviors uh, for our second goal. And then also we want to create and maintain a contingency plan for anything that might come our way next year. Uh, as a result of uh, COVID and uh, anything that might be unexpected and make sure that we're transitioning back into a smooth uh, school year. So that's all I got and uh, I'll pass it on to Beth. Beth, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so I'd like to echo some of Ryan's concerns in that a lot of the practices that were put in place at Union Elementary School were also put in place at Roxbury Village School, including the pod model where we had two adults in every classroom. We really honed in on students' social emotional behavior learning needs this year and really supported our staff as they worked to support our students. One thing that I would like to share also is that encompassing all of our work at Roxbury is our common vision of every student every day and really having a true commitment to ensuring that each student has a trusted adult in the building that knows them well and that pod model goes a long way to serve that. At Roxbury, some of our goals for this year including include building a culture of literacy that fosters student achievement so for this year, we'd like to have 70% of our students reading at or above grade level as measured by Fontes and Fennell. And to that end, if someone can just click the slide again. So we're focusing on grade level priority standards, looking at data on a regular basis to see where our students are at. When we see that students are not achieving, we're looking to see what we can do to enhance the instruction and learning for those students. Um, focusing on discrete skill development, so what that means is having a hyper focus on some of the skills that they need. So for example, as Ryan referenced with letter ID, knowing your letters is a primary skill that needs to take place before other reading pieces can be put in place, such as sight words or stringing words together in a sentence. So really honing in on what skills need to be developed for individual students. If you can click again, that'd be great. We also have an initiative going on right now called Everybody Reads. And with that goes our motto of every student every day. So every single student at our school reads with an adult in addition to their regular reading instruction. And the purpose for that is twofold. One, it gives an opportunity for a student to practice their oral reading fluency, but also it gives a student an important connection to an adult in the building to foster those positive relationships. Another goal we have this year is to develop a school-wide professional learning community. As a small school, we have a small cadre of staff. 
so we are all working together on a common goal to promote social emotional and behavioral learning skills in our students and as a relatively new staff we are coming together to look at student data really having data driven decision making and a shared commitment to student success so as a staff, we identified some of the data and it was showing that there were misbehaviors occurring during transition periods. So we dug down a little deeper to identify some root causes and what skills might have been lacking to cause those behaviors to occur. So we utilized um, some evidence-based practices to teach those lagging skills. And then in turn, show those to students through modeling and sharing the expectations and ensuring that students had a clear understanding of what was expected. And as a result, we saw significant improvement in student behaviors during those transition periods. Another goal we had this year was to foster a school culture of responsibility, respect and compassion. Again, using evidence based practices also working with Mary and Kayla that Ryan had referenced. They met with our staff on Thursday afternoons to talk about various practices that we could put in place, discussing some protocols and strategies such as a um, positive to negative behavior recognition, talking about other, um, basically just noticing when children are behaving well and calling them on their positive behavior as opposed to focusing on the negative behavior. And as a result, our average referrals decreased by over 50% from December to April. And this is measured by SWIS data. So for those of you that aren't familiar, um, SWIS is a data management system where we catalog all of our behavioral referrals and it provides really good information on when the behavior is occurring, where they are occurring. It helps us identify some of the high flyers, so the top five students that might be experiencing specific behaviors, and really allows us to hone in and address those behaviors specifically in regard to those student needs. So just a broad overview of some of our work this year, 100% of our students have made gains in reading from the beginning of the year, as measured by the Pontus and Pinnell Benchmark Assessment. And we use a screener called Renaissance. And in our math assessment for Renaissance, we had a 43, 43 point increase from fall to winter in math. Our school attendance is terrific. It's 91.46% per day. This speaks to student engagement. So our students really want to come to school. They feel safe at school. They see it as a welcoming community. They want to be with their friends and their teachers and they want to learn. And as I've already shared, our referrals have decreased by 50, over 50% 50 in terms of student behaviors. Some of our goals for the upcoming year that are tied to our CIP are by the end of next year, we'll increase our math proficiency by 10% for next year and then an additional 10% the following year. We'll do that through professional development with Christian Cordemanche. We'll continue to implement math menu to differentiate instruction for individual students. And we will focus on our master schedule where we have a 90 minute math block and integrate 30 minutes of that for win time, win meaning what I need so that every student gets targeted instruction in what they need. Another goal that we have for next year is building a culture of literacy. Ryan had referenced that we had a PLL literacy audit this year. They gave us some very valuable information for how we can transform literacy for our students. And so for next year, we'd like to have at least 85% of all of our students meeting or exceeding grade level expectations and 100% of our fourth grade students. And I recognize that 100% is a lofty goal. However, research states that students that are not reading on grade level by the end of fourth grade are more likely to drop out of high school. So we take that 100% very seriously and that's a goal that we'd like to work toward. Part of that work references our professional development with Teachers College. We'll increase our time for collaboration as a K-4 school, ensuring that every teacher is working in a vertically and horizontally aligned team, horizontally across the district with other grade level peers from UES and vertically with other teachers in our building so that we're building a K-4 continuum for literacy. 
and again, embedding a 90 minute literacy block into our master schedule, where 60 minutes is focusing on regular instruction and an additional 30 minutes is spent on what I need. So again, really targeting those specific skills that students need to develop to achieve in reading. Another goal that we have for next year is to further reduce our discipline referrals by 50% over the end of this year. So again, cutting our discipline referrals in half for next year by continuing to build our work as a staff. It's our plan to develop an advisory program where we have every single student in our school connected to an adult in the building. Right now we have 28 students in our building. Several of our students are currently taking part in the virtual academy or through or are doing home study. And so with an addition of students next year, we will increase our population from 28 students to 46 students. And so understanding that we'll have to reintegrate some of those students back into our school, building relationships will go a long way to having them return in a safe, welcoming environment. We'll also continue our work with Mary and Kayla, increasing our staff's understanding of SEBL, particularly as they refer to trauma-informed practices. And we'll also begin a school-wide Monday morning meeting to build a community of learners at Roxbury Village School. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start by echoing what Libby spoke to in the beginning that um, all of the work I'm, I'm about to talk about is embodies our teachers at Main Street Middle School have been flexible and innovative and have just worked so hard this year to um, move forward in a pandemic when, as Libby stated, we had no idea what was ahead of us. Um, so I'm really proud of the staff at Main Street Middle School. Our three focus areas this year, we had an SEL focus. Um, we also adopted a pod model um, and many of the things that Ryan spoke to and Beth echoed, uh, ticketing system, checking in to make sure um, staff, students and families were feeling safe um, as far as health safety goes. And then we had a huge focus on looking at our social emotional behavioral systems school-wide and what systems did we have in place and where were we looking to head. Um, we adopted Swiss data and are now using that with Fidelity. Um, and that is now also informing tier one instruction and building um, opportunities to provide those students who need tier two support um, in those different areas. We had a commitment to building our capacity around ELA and mathematics instruction, um, setting up opportunities for our teachers to have really high quality professional development. Um, TDG is Teachers Development Group, which is a national um, professional development organization that we have begun a partnership with that our seven, eight math teachers have been working with. Kristen Quartermunch, um, our fifth and sixth grade teachers are in their first year of math menu, which Ryan spoke to. So um, well, we're finishing out our first year now. So we're really excited for that work. And then like Beth and Ryan spoke to, um, our district was part of the PLL audit um, and we got a lot of great information about our literacy instruction, which we'll be using um, as we move forward. And then our third focus area was continuing our work as a professional learning community. Our teachers are part of collaborative teams, which are predominantly content-based and those teams meet after students leave the building each day, focused on the four guiding questions of a professional learning community. So what do we want our students to know and be able to do? How are we going to know if they've achieved that? What are we going to do to support those students who have not met the target? And what are we going to do to support the students who have already met the target? So within that, um, each collaborative team is at a different stage in this work. Some are working on their common units of study um, within that common formative and summative assessment. So making sure we know where our students are at working on our data collection system. So making sure that we are tracking students not only at the end of units, but throughout the units to be able to support them in exactly what they need. And then embedded opportunities for intervention and extensions. And that has looked quite different this year um, due to COVID. And so I think I'm gonna speak in a few slides to that, um, but we have been pretty innovative with that piece of it. And of course, these are all tied to our district pillars. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so just some data highlights. Uh, we had a 45% decrease in Swiss referrals since the beginning of the year. Um, and I chose to look at that, da that data because this is the first year that we really have been implementing Swiss data with Fidelity. 
And so um, with that came also the pieces of supporting students and teachers once we had the data and I started in taking time to look at it, then we saw a decrease in that um, supporting students. A 32% decrease in nurse care. Um, this one's pretty interesting. Our nurse has been doing pod calls, house calls, instead of having students come to the nurse's office this year. So we've had a lot of conversations about, um, especially at the middle level, students often their social emotional needs manifest themselves in physical ailments often. And so um, students are spending a lot more time in, in their classrooms this year, not having the option of heading down to the nurse's office. So we've talked about how do we, how do we look at that going forward um, to make sure our resiliency team is there to support students. Uh, we have a large decrease in students being pulled from tier one instruction to access other supports. Just um, that was a direct result of what we could do within our model based on COVID. But again, that's something that we've learned from this year. How do we continue going forward to keep as many students in tier one instruction as possible? And we have no evidence of pandemic learning loss according to our winter screener data. So um, like Beth spoke to, the RENSTAR assessment is something that we give a few times during the year. And uh, this was our winter data. So one example of um, our formalized essential learning systems and timely systems to enrich, intervene, and remediate. Um, I pulled a specific example in seventh and eighth grade mathematics to show you how we're responding, looking at data as collaborative teams and responding to it as a school. So 41% of our seventh and eighth graders on the star screener showed mastery of skills and fraction concepts and operations. So that's a pretty low percentage of students. So from that though, it wasn't enough in information to find out exactly what those specific skills they had mastered and which ones they needed to work on. So our teachers worked to develop an online pretest to gather further information. And from that, three skills were identified. Uh, fraction foundational skills, multiplying and dividing fractions, adding and subtracting fractions came out from that as areas um, that our students, seventh and eighth graders needed to focus on. So one tier one response in the classroom, our teachers started incorporating those into some of their warm-up problems during their regular lesson time. Then three uh, student support modules were built online. And this is where we got innovative, the, innovative this year in that students were not being pulled um, from classrooms to work in small groups and focus, um, focus on skills. And so how, did we, how could we meet the needs of all students within the classroom and all of these COVID restrictions? So the modules were built online um, based on these three skills for this specific example. They were a combination of independent lessons, videos, practice problems for students, and then multiple post tests were developed for students to access. So if they were not successful, um, so they would go through these different pieces of it. And then they would, if they felt that they were ready to take the post test, they would take it. They had to achieve 90% accuracy in order to be considered proficient. But if they had not met that 90% accuracy, then there was another test made. Um, and our math coach made uh, many tests for some of these to ensure that our students who needed to continue working to achieve mastery had the opportunity, um, as well as teachers then were working with small groups of students who needed some extra direct instruction to try to help them achieve this goal. So with this particular example, 86% um, of seventh and eighth graders um, had shown mastery of the three identified skills and 14% continue to work towards that mastery. So that's just one um, illustration of how we've been supporting students in, in the year of COVID um, to ensure all students are getting exactly what they need. School-wide, um, looking at SEBL data and making decisions based on that. So we have a resiliency team at the middle school, which is made up of our school nurse, our school counselor, our school social worker, and our uh, new this year SEL teacher. Um, and so they've been working really closely this year to support all students. Um, we also have an SEBL team that in addition to that team of teachers adds um, a classroom teacher and a special educator so that we have kind of the whole school perspective of how are we supporting our SEBL needs of our students. 
And so prior to this year, we didn't have a lot of concrete data around what was happening with our students and how was that impacting instruction. So like Beth mentioned, we also implemented Swiss data in our building. And from that, um, each week, our grade level teams are now meeting with the resiliency team, having essentially a social emotional behavioral learning kid chat based on the grade level. So an example would be in fifth grade on one day of the week, they meet, the fifth grade team meets with the resiliency team. They take a look at what is our data telling us they first look at if we're seeing a trend across the whole grade, all right, what adjustments can we make to our tier one classrooms to support this? And it might, some things come up in it, such as executive functioning skills. So we're noticing lots of kids are struggling right now with the organization. So let's do something in our classroom to support all kids. Then from that comes, okay, we've identified a few students who are struggling, um, but it's not a whole class response to things. So we look at, um, members of the resiliency team who can be forming small groups with students um, and they've been meeting virtually with students this year um, as well as one-on-one -on -one to support those individual needs as well as looking at next steps for students who are coming up in that Swiss data week after week. So um, having parent meetings, making behavior plans, looking at developing really specific interventions to support students. But the big shift this year is we now have data that's driving all of this work. So where are we headed next year? Um, continuing to look at that focus in math and ELA now that we're heading into year two of our math professional development and starting with Teachers College, like Beth had mentioned in ELA, We'd like to see an increase in consistency regarding growth rates across the school. Vertical alignment um, is not, right now that's an area for growth um, at the middle school. And so we're hoping to see through, now that everyone has been doing common professional development work in grades five and six and seven, eight in mathematics, and then our teacher's college work related to um, the PLL audit will be five through eight, that we will see more consistency across the building um, with vertical alignment coming into play. The next piece is looking at um, our curriculum with an equity lens. So right now um, we've rolled out the option for teachers to start exploring, um, looking at their classroom libraries, um, using a tool called BookSource. So we have these really great scanners that um, a company has developed this amazing um, database essentially where you scan your books in and it shows what, what is represented in your classroom library. What are areas that are really strong? What are you missing? So that's one piece of it as well as looking at our curriculum with that same lens. The next piece is ensuring that we take what we've learned this year about tier two interventions happening in the classroom and try to have 20% less time um, of our special education students being pulled out of the classroom because we have really seen this year that it can be done and how, how much more powerful it is to ensure those students are staying in the room um, accessing grade level curriculum. And then we've worked this year on a three-year SEBL plan so we started that this year with kind of the Swiss data being the focus for this year. And then next year, we'll continue to move forward with that, um, moving into making sure that we have a clearly defined philosophy across the middle school based in restorative uh, practices, as well as an equitable SEBL system. Um, so we'll continue that work with our entire community. Ah, you would think I would know how to unmute by now. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, I just want to first, first of all, I'm happy to round out the school presentations. Um, I want to reiterate just something that Libby had shared at the beginning. It is a true celebration just to be at the end of this presentation and to see um, all the wonderful things um, that have happened across all schools and really moving um, forward is not the norm based on my understanding and conversations with other principals across the state. So to see um, how much movement um, this team has made in a positive direction is uh, no easy feat. And I also wanna recognize Libby for her leadership and her support because I know that um, all of us have leaned on her in a number of ways. And I know certainly I have, so thank you Libby. 
Um, at the high school, if you haven't had uh, a student or a child come through the high school, um, you wouldn't know really any different than what we did this year, but this year was an in uh, insanely innovative, um, awesome year um, in a lot of ways. Uh, usually at, at the high school, uh, we are on semesters um, or year long courses. This year, because of the safety guidelines, because of class sizes and the size of our classrooms, we moved to a quarter system. So that's basically nine weeks, um, four times a year. And our students were taking two courses per quarter. Um, they were on a part-time schedule. So they were divvied up either into an AM or PM cohort by two and a half hour um, time slots. And so students had the choice of whether they could come in the morning or they could come in the afternoon. Um, our class sizes were cut in half, um, obviously because of the safety guidelines and not being able to have any more than 13 students per class. Um, we offered enrichment courses this year, which was, um, which was really eye-opening, I think, in a lot of ways for us because enrichment courses basically ran um, the same way that traditional courses ran um, in that students would come twice a week to school um, for two and a half hours, but they were only getting uh, a quarter of the credit that they would get in a traditional class and they weren't getting a grade. Um, and you'll see in the data below that there was a number of students who um, participated in that even though they didn't need to. Um, and then we had a remote Wednesdays. We started our, our school year off um, making sure that we had a midweek deep clean um, and we held true to that schedule for the remainder of the year. Um, quick data for this year. Um, less than 3% of our students um, did not meet proficiency across quarter one and quarter three. Um, that's pretty awesome for a 310 um, student population. That's uh, awesome. So the amount of courses that we um, have offered, that, that means like eight to 10 students didn't meet proficiency across those quarters. Um, our average student attendance was almost 98%, also up from a normal or typical year. We had an 87% uh, decrease in behavioral referrals from our semester. So I, we, we equated or equaled this from the first semester of 2019 to really our first semester of this year, which was quarter one and quarter two, um, an 87% decrease in behavioral referrals. Um, as noted before, we had 286 enrolled students in enrichment courses this year. Just a reminder that those courses um, students could just opt into. Um, they didn't have to be enrolled in them for, um, for graduation credits. Um, so that was um, telling in a lot of ways as well. And then we had 68% fewer teacher absences this year um, than we've had in a typical year. Um, all in all, it's been a very successful year. It's, it's not a year that we will roll over to next year as far as the quarter system. I think there's a lot of things that we've learned from this year moving into um, next year, um, but certainly there's some things that we just can't, be, we can't roll over into um, the following year. So some of our goals that we had for this year, and that speaks to what the other schools, you know, the fact that we were able to even, um, um, work on these goals and, and not focus on COVID and pandemic and whether our students were um, in school or you know needing to go remote um, is certainly a celebration. So our goals for this year were, were for our school to use um, STAR, which you've heard about in the other presentations, to identify who, um, which students are most at risk for not meeting proficiency or benchmark in math and in reading. Um, this is the first year for us at the high school that we really spent time looking at the STAR data, both in the fall and the spring, um, and doing grade level data analysis. And, and what was nice for, for our teachers this year was that um, when we took the fall data, when we had the STAR data in the fall, um, and reviewed that, then teachers in quarter two and quarter three were actually able to go back and look at that data um, to have a, a little bit more of an understanding of students who were coming into their class, especially because we were decreasing from a year long class into a nine week course. Um, having that information ahead of time was, was valuable. Um, in addition to uh, that goal, we have our PLC teams, admin, district consultants um, would work together to ensure standards and learning targets would be identified, articulated, and documented. Um, we've had a lot of wonderful opportunities this year as far as professional development. You've already heard about um, Teachers Development Group, TDG, who also is working with our math team. Um, it's been wonderful to have the middle school and high school math teams working together and also working separately. Um, and that includes Katie, um, Mike Berry, me, um, Amy Kimball, who are, are also a part of the leadership coaching um, with TDG. 
Uh, Liz Mira, who is an educational consultant, has been working with our science team over the last uh, couple months or so, um, really working on articulation of standards and getting into the NGSS standards and um, just having some really good collaborative conversations. Um, as you've also heard, professional learning and literacy, PLL, um, we also were audited as a high school um, and were presented to uh, the staff last week. And so we'll be digging into that as a guiding coalition in the next week um, to set some goals for next year. Our social studies department um, has been meeting regularly to articulate standards um, and skills across all grades and courses. We have a couple new uh, courses that have come to fruition this year that we're really excited about for next year. And then we have dedicated uh, every Wednesday morning for PLC time. And our teachers are in different teams revising units of study and assessments. Um, similar to the last school that I just spoke, spoke about, um, PLC teams, admin, district consultants will collaborate to create common benchmark formative and summative assessments. So as a part of that Wednesday um, time, our teams are really developing these units of study. And um, what they're doing this year is they're actually giving a common assessment and then they're spending time reviewing that data, um, calibrating around the data. And that really just means, are they, are they scoring um, are they scoring those assessments similarly? And if they're not, then they need to have conversations why and, and, and um, dig into that a little bit more. Gathering student feedback. And then the hopes of that obviously is to adjust future in instruction and or the assessment itself. And then uh, as far as SBL, we've been really focused on building a foundational knowledge around um, social, social emotional behavioral learning and why um, we need to implement this within the high school. Um, there's been a, a strong focus this year on restorative practices um, and um, gaining a clear understanding of tier one, tier two, and tier three as it relates to behaviors. Um, similar to the other schools, we created a three-year plan. Um, data systems and practices are in place to teach and support the acquisition and use of defined social emotional behavioral skills for both staff and students. Um, this year, there's been a really strong focus, as I said before, on the restorative practices, um, specifically on restorative circles. And we've had a really wonderful team um, represented by teachers, our social worker, um, guidance counselors, and actually we have students um, who are participating on um, leading actually staff circles. So there's a restorative practice student led team, um, a staff led team, and um, we've had a lot of wonderful opportunities um, to learn from both students and staff this year, along with John Kidda, who's also a consultant um, that works across the district. Um, and we will continue to do that work moving into next year. It's been very powerful, um, just about around building community. And we practice it a lot in our staff meetings. Um, and that has really carried over into um, other settings, either in virtual or within the classrooms as well. So our goals heading into next year, um, one of the things that's really important to us, and I, and I just have to say, this is the first time, uh, this is my second year. I feel like I've been here for five years, but um, this is my second year. And it was the first time that our um, guiding coalition um, really went through a process to get to the goals that, we, that you see in front of you tonight. Um, extremely proud. We did it in a really tight time frame, but we came up some really great goals for us in moving our work forward. Um, so by the end of next year, um, our school will be expected to document um, all of their curriculum within the MRPS expected framework. Um, and what this means is that this means that this is a guaranteed and viable curriculum for all students. Um, that means all students get the same curriculum. So if there's two teachers teaching the same, um, the same course, they're gonna get the same assignments, they're gonna get the same learning, they're gonna get the same assessments, and those teachers should be working together to ensure um, that the curriculum is meeting the needs of all students. Um, the next goal is that we're gonna create structures that support a multi-tiered system, that's the MTSS, um, to assist students who need additional targeted instruction and or enrichment. Um, by doing this, this just increases opportunities for all students. So we talk about the achievement gap. We speak at the high school about the opportunity gap um, in that sometimes when students come into the high school by ninth grade, they already know what um, their trajectory is. And sometimes that isn't college. And so when we talk about tiered systems, this is an opportunity to increase um, post-secondary um, options for all of our students um, and not just a certain population of our students. The next goal is that we will have an effective PLC teaming process and protocol that will lead to effective evaluation of high quality instruction through the use of data. 
Um, we are in the process similar, you know, Katie said that this is a, a, a second year really beginning to dig into using data. I would say at the high school, we are in the process of collecting data and creating a data inventory. Um, and we've created an assessment calendar next year so that we also are using data to support our um, instruction and our practices around the school. This will have an, uh, an effect on teacher collaboration and their collective efficacy, which we know will boost student achievement. And then with our SABL, we are gonna continue to build a stronger knowledge around MTSS. Um, that's the tier one, tier two, tier three. And then we'll determine the data that needs to be collected there and we'll create, create a system to evaluate that and then act on the data. Um, and with that said, we're gonna continue, as I said before, with the restorative practices um, and moving and learning more about restorative justice as a school. So in addition to all of those goals, what else is ahead for us besides more gray hair from me? Um, we have systems of support, which is basically restructuring our solo block time. So we have a separate 30 minute time within our day um, that we will be using and we have used towards tier two intervention. We're just going to restructure it better so that teachers have more support in directly um, working with those students um, without having to ne necessarily navigate another group of students within them. We're also going to um, offer work labs across our school. Um, this is gonna offer more intervention time for students who will need it um, outside of also that Solon block. And, um, awesome news that we get a higher math and literacy interventionist, which really rounds out um, the MTSS team. Uh, without a math or literacy interventionist, sometimes um, special, special educators or general education teachers don't necessarily have the strategies that um, we, need, we need to be able to offer teachers um, to really give those tier three interventions um, when looking at systems of support. And then uh, we're gonna be reviewing and revising our current learning expectations and our proficiency skills. Those are basically the transferable skills um, that we have at the high school. There's 37 of them now. We're gonna hope to hopefully whittle those down to a nice seven or eight possibly. Um, we're gonna build literacy knowledge for all faculty based on that audit um, that's been spoken of before. And we're gonna prioritize our needs for all staff. And then our flexible pathways, which is an incredible program for our students, will continue to build important partnerships and offer those personalized learning opportunities for all students. And then through SEBL, we're gonna re-envision our TA time, which is our teacher advisory time. Um, we are offering the alternative programming next year with a therapeutic and acad academic support. So when you hear us talk about that, you'll hear me um, call it Thrive. That's what we um, have named it. And then we're going to continue to work on restorative practices with John Kidda and the restorative practices student group and the restorative practices teacher team. A lot of good work ahead for the team. Great. Thank you, everyone. That was fantastic. Um, really impressive work. Uh, and it's great to hear about it. I think the board really appreciates when you hear what's what's going on programmatically uh, at all of the schools and um, you know, what sort of results you're seeing. Um, uh, let's open it up to comment. Let me just see if I can get back to, okay, there I am. Um, Amanda. I think it's an old hand, sorry. I will come back. Okay. Uh, Jill. Thank you. I'm so glad that we had that opportunity to really take a look at everything. I mean, I think one of the things we haven't had a chance to do is celebrate, and I mean that in every way, what you all just took us through. I really feel like you folks were the front lines of sort of protecting and helping our community thrive, our kids, our parents, our educators. I, I can't think of the words, but I just, I think we're really going to look back on this time in the future and just truly feel the magnitude of what you just did because you didn't just sort of get us through it. You thrived and our students did fantastic and, and we did it. Like it's May. I think we can actually say like, okay, like I think Katie's Gator News said something about six weeks left or five weeks left. It's like to think that what you all have accomplished and what you've done for hundreds of people in this community. I just, I can't thank you enough. I, I really, I really mean it. I Statewide, nationally, internationally. I'm really glad my kid was in this district this year. Um, 
I did wonder, and then maybe this is a hypothetical or maybe you can talk about it another time, but I really am curious about some of that really fascinating data about behavior and if you have any theories about why it was that significant, I mean, I figured maybe some, and I don't know, is it the masks? Is it the pod? Like, I don't know what the what is, but if we could learn from that and and keep that rolling in the future, I think that would be fantastic. But those are really, um, really impressive statistics. And um, I really appreciate all the effort that just went into that. And I wish we were in person because I think we would give you guys a round of applause. So <laughs> there's my little... I will clap, but um, I can't thank you enough. Yeah, does someone want to field that? And I just want to echo everything that Jill said. I mean, the um, what what you all have accomplished this year is is amazing, um, and and I think Jill summed it up very well when she said, uh, and it definitely speaks for me. And I'm so glad my kids were in this district as well, uh, especially you know hearing tales of, of what other other kids in other districts, yeah, some very good districts went through. I mean, some some are just returning to the classroom now and um, after a very, very tough year. And it's, it's been uh, a year where, uh, yeah, we not only persevered, but we, we thrived. And that's that's super impressive and, and a real testament to the great work and creativity of, of, of the, the team, the community. So, so thank you. Um, I know Jill had a question in there about the, the data, so happy to have anyone answer that. And then, uh, and then yeah. As we, we've talked throughout the year about that, and I think there's lots of things that go into it. Um, and I can say my kids started full, full days every day today, this week. So <laughs> this week was the first week. Um, the, uh, so one, transitions were significantly cut down, significantly. Space between kids was significantly increased. <laughs> Um, we had two, a lot of adults in rooms. So in our K-8s, we had two, two adults in each room, which really, really helped, I think, support not only the kids, but also the teacher as a former teen teacher myself in a classroom. So I was with two, had two people in the classroom. It says something when you can look across the room and just make eye contact <laughs> at certain points. So I think probably teacher stress levels were lower as well at times. Um, other things that we've talked about is that the hallway, you know, hallways are a significant um, transition time, particularly for middle schoolers, because they have a lot of freedom during that time. And they had less of that this year, quite honestly. Um, recess is also an area at the elementary school that typically is a big time in at the middle school, and there's less kids out there um, this year. So those are some of the things that we all talked about. Did any, anybody want to add on to that? That it's something I missed? I think for the high school, I mean, cutting the class size in half um, was significant for us. You just can't hide, you know, in a class of 13. Um, so all the, that Libby said, as far as the transitions between classes, only having to focus on two classes for a quarter um, and not having to transition between classes in the day, I think really cut down on the, the behaviors for us this year. Thank you. Um, Mia. Um, I'm, I also want to echo what Jill said, and, and actually I'm, I'm not really good at extemporaneous speaking. So I looked up the email that I sent to, um, for those of you principals who don't know me and my, my kids are in elementary school. So I haven't yet gotten a chance to meet, um, and work with, uh, uh Katie and, and Renee and, and of course, Beth, um, the, my kids are in the Montpelier elementary school, but I sent this email to Ryan. Um, I'm going to get a little emotional here because you really have done amazing things this year. Um, on the first day of school. And I think the sentiment still stands. Um, just a, just thank you so much for everything that you've done. The whole team at Union to make all of it possible. Um, we're incredibly grateful that our children will be with their friends and learning from dedicated, caring, wonderful educators. It really means so much and it wouldn't be possible with everything that you've done over the course of the summer, of course, and then have continued to do all year. And in all the conversations that we've had with our kids' teachers, they have been nothing but positive, focused, and forward thinking. And that kind of an attitude comes from the leadership. I know that from experience, and especially when everything is so uncertain and scary. So I just wanted to, to echo what Jill said and, and, and add my own remarks to that. 
Um, really, really deeply appreciate everything you all have done. And I also have a question. <laughs> um, I am curious to know what process you use to create these incredible continuous improvement plans. Um, you know, how do you, what, who do you gather input from? How do you, I, you know, I heard a lot of talk about data, but is there, what other input do you learn and, and, and what, what process does that follow? Do you all follow? Mike, you want to take that? Sure. Yeah. The data really comes from all over the place. So I'll use Ryan as an example uh, because he's leaving. Um, he has a, a parent group that is a part of his world that meets on a regular basis and talks about the school and the direction of things. The feedback he gets from that parent group feeds directly into the comprehensive needs assessment process that we go through. So it's all collected from all over the place in addition to the, the hard data that we collect along the way. But one of the things that we do in that comprehensive needs assessment that's really interesting is that we look at drivers. So we look at a piece of data and initially there's some reflexive um, decisions and, and, and reflexive ideas about why something's happening. But then we dig a layer deeper and start thinking about other stakeholder groups and other concepts that may be contributing to the data that we're seeing. And that's where that conversation comes from. So if you go to that first slide again, that whole process really starts to articulate all of the different components that come into play when we're thinking about the school community. Um, that, that's very helpful. Thank you, Mike. I, just a couple of follow, uh, follow up is, I, and maybe it's just because I was trying to process what everyone was saying, and so I didn't t fully take in what was on the slide. Mm -hmm. uh, what, how do teachers contribute throughout that process, and and if if students contribute throughout that process, and if so, how do they? Sure, there's a lot of probably specific examples from the different schools, but at each school, there's a leadership team that is a big part of this work. Um, they're the ones that drive it. They seek feedback from their colleagues at various levels in different ways throughout the entire process. And in many cases that involves students as well. So thinking about like, I know at the middle school or the, at the high school, for example, there was discussion about, you know, what is it that students liked about the schedule this year? And how is that going to impact their decisions around the scheduling for next year? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that's involved, but that leadership team at each school that guiding coalition is really a big component of it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Kristen. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I'm Kristen Gettler. I am a very, very new board member coming from Roxbury. And um, I was like holding back on like the finger snaps and sparkle fingers. There was just like so much to feel so great about. And just for me, like coming to know this district and the people who truly make up this district on a day to day basis for our kids, it's just like really wonderful to get a window into who you all are and what our schools are, are looking and feeling like for our kids right now. Um, so thank you for that. I'm going to might have a special guest um, five year old any moment. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think just as a new board member, it also just like this serves to provide me like much pride in, in serving in this role and being able to, you know, work with you all and represent, you know, what it is that you're doing. So just thank you so much for the opportunity to get the window into what is happening in our schools and for our students. Um, and I just like, what an incredible amount of adaptability and shape-shifting. It's, it's just incredible. So just thank you, Libby, all principals, thank you. Um, so I'm curious about a couple things. Um, one, it seems like, you know, um, and it's been a, a really wonderful thing to at times reflect on COVID and that there was some silver linings. And it, I heard kind of several examples of like um, things that we might have learned and, and possibly borrow and like institute. Um, like, you know, I heard uh, was it the pod calls, you know, at, um, at the middle school, which was um, just a really cool innovation. And I'm just curious, like what COVID innovations might stick and change the way in which we kind of like do business um, and educating our kids. Um, and then I'm also curious about, you know, there was just so much um, to learn here and so much to be impressed by. And I'm curious how like, you know, the goals or the data and this information like could get out to, um, you know, parents and community members a prospecting, you know, family thinking about moving um, their family into this district and how they can become aware of it because it just feels so like representative of how 
um, like aspirational and, and diligent and thorough um, that this district is. Um, and just one last thing I just did really appreciate, I know data can be um, not that interested, I'm, I'm really interested in data, but it was really cool to hear about how a certain like data sets and points like translates into like creative programming or just the ways in which you then like meet students. So I really, I, I really appreciated just kind of hearing about those connections and relationships. So um, thank you all so much. How about, um, cause we've talked about what we wanna keep quite a bit. How about everybody just share one thing? Does that, does that help? Kristen, Kristen is actually- Yeah, sorry, that was a lot. Thank you for distilling. Yeah. Yes, that's great. So, Renee, I'll tag you first. <laughs> No, <laughs> it, you know, there was so much beauty out of this year. I think for, for us, there was a lot of, so um, I, I don't, I think Mike mentioned it about the schedule. Um, we got a lot of feedback from our, our families, our students, um, our staff about next year's schedule. Um, and, you know, I thought that it was going to maybe go in a, in a completely different direction and it didn't, and that's okay. I think what we will, um, what I will carry with us, and I think that that was a part of our scheduling committee, um, their conversations too, was how do we get students to come to school? So I was talking about those enrichment courses where they're only worth a quarter of a credit. Um, and students were coming to school the same amount of time that uh, other students were coming to school for a full year's credit. Um, and they were coming because they wanted to be there and they were engaged in the work. And it wasn't because they were getting an A, B, C, or D. Um, it's because they loved what they were doing, um, whether it was cooking and cooking to serve the community, or they were learning about Marvel heroes and villains. Um, I think that that's something that we wanna carry over into next year. Um, and thinking about ways that we can engage students in those traditional classrooms that, that bring kids to school and want them to be there as well. Ryan, I thought you were going to leave, but you're next. No, uh, so two big things come to mind for me. First, I think we had a huge uh, technology shift. So teachers that had always been a little hesitant to try new things or maybe take risk around technology went through a learning curve that just had to happen. And so one thing that we're seeing is that all of our teachers have become very proficient in technology. So that's been a, I think that's been a huge bonus. Another thing that's been really great is that teachers that hadn't worked together closely in the past, or maybe didn't have a really good understanding of different content areas. So, you know, thinking about our music teacher, um, Sam LaFleur, working in a first grade classroom this year. And so she had a very different perspective around what the classroom teacher does on a day-to-day -day basis. And the classroom teacher got a very different perspective around the workload that she has as somebody that meets the needs of every kid in the school. And they were able to share a lot of different practices and they were integrate a lot of music into lessons, a lot of different things that, that uh, never would have happened if we didn't have this opportunity. So I think the long-term positive impact is really going to be about those experiences that adults had working with adults that they had never worked with before. Yeah, Max and his partner, same, same thing, I think. Had a lot of work that way. Uh, let's see, Beth, you're up next. I'll echo Ryan's sentiment about the technology, but from a different perspective. So Roxbury being 25 miles away from Montpelier, puts its pretty significant dent in the time that needs to be spent traveling between Roxbury and Montpelier for professional development. Now with Zoom, it can happen almost instantaneously and it just enhances the connection between our elementary schools. It really puts the physical distance aside that we can just connect online and really further build some of those horizontal connections that we wanna make with our grade level partners at UES. Um, and my other thing is a little different. So I'm new to Roxbury, but it's my understanding that in the past, students had come in in the morning and gone straight to the cafeteria for breakfast. Very few students actually ate. My understanding is that it became very chaotic and very hard to manage. And there were things that happened. And it was a it was a 20 minute time frame for kids to um, really just not have any specific focus. 
However, this year, because of COVID, we have had our students eating in the classroom. And one of the things that I'd really like to continue next year is the way that we do breakfast. So when you arrive at Roxbury Village School in the morning, you are treated to a veritable buffet of breakfast goodies. Miss Louise will have a breakfast sandwich, yogurt, cereal, fruit, juice, milk. I think I've had worse breakfasts at hotels than what she serves in the morning for our students. And the most lovely thing is they're greeted with a warm, friendly person who's happy to see them. She's giving them food and then they take it back to their classroom. And as they're eating, they're integrating socially with their teachers, with their peers. Sometimes if they finish early, it gives the teacher just a brief five, 10 minutes to go through some sight words with the student or just to check in on a personal level. And I just really enjoyed that warm welcome that we're able to offer students in the morning when they arrive and get breakfast and a friendly smile from Louise. So that's been lovely. Louise we'll was a find. She was most definitely a find. Katie, your last. Um, I think there's two different things that I want to speak to, but there, there are a number of things that I think we're considering carrying forward at the middle school. But one is uh, movement breaks have been commonplace in elementary classrooms for years, um, but at the middle level, we took it, it we didn't have an, another option, right? Our students needed to move in the pod model. And so our five through eight classrooms have now um, daily movement breaks multiple times a day. Um, you walk into an eighth grade classroom and students are dancing or exercising or following along to different types of movement breaks. And so I think that that's something um, from student surveys that as well as from surveying staff that we will continue uh, going forward. And then the other pieces in the fall, our SEBL team was meeting um, and just ha had a conversation about it, it doesn't feel like a middle school in our building. Where's the, where's the fun that should be happening? And so from that conversation, the pod Olympics were born. Um, and so we had two, two weeks when we came back from break in January where our whole school engaged in the pod Olympics and it was a huge success. 96% um, of students and staff and somewhere around there in the high nineties uh, wanted it to become an annual thing. So that's gonna stick and we're gonna, we're gonna keep the name so it has some historical uh, memory to it. So those are two things at the middle school. Awesome. Um, Amanda. I want to echo all the thank yous and all the greatness. Um, I also just want to take the time to appreciate Mr. Herity, who I have um, worked with now for three years since my daughter entered kinder and the first thing I was, I was complaining about a policy and he says, I want you in my psych council. And I was like, you don't want me, I'm very opinionated. He's like, no, I do, I need someone um, that says it as it is. So in that vein, um, yeah, I just wanna appreciate it. Appreciate you and all the work that you have done and really all the listening you have done to all the caregivers and working with us to really make uh, the school inclusive and like upholding equity principles and really, you know, come into our meetings at 8 p.m. Uh, after long days just to um, really be there. So I really appreciate it. And you are leaving some big shoes to fill. And um, I, yeah, I, I wish you all the best and thank you for all you've done. So with that, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, did we have a, a virtual report or was that integrated in, in that? Or did I fall asleep? A lot of it, a lot of those, um, we tried not to separate the data that much. We tried to put it together. So a lot of the data was, was inclusive of UES and RVS and MSMS. Okay. But no, Mike didn't do a separate virtual academy one. Okay. And then um, I had a question regarding the free food and how you think that impacted some of the social emotional support that students were having and, and how that related to maybe the decrease in behavior when kids are full and have food, um, how that kind of related if, if, if you thought that had some impact. Um, I had questions regarding 
um, BIPOC students and social emotional learning around them. And around some of the data, I know that um, we're still trying to figure out if data can be desegregated for the board and how we look at the data um, for marginalized students, students from the LGBTQ community, disability rights. I am um, still thinking about um, the testimony that we heard this morning and just trying to like think about, you know, like what are the challenges? I, I, so, I see amazing. I, you know, I um, have so much love for all the teachers and all the staff and all of you that have worked so hard to make this amazing district. Also very proud to be in this district my, for my daughter to have had that experience. Um, but I do like, I just, I, I wanna also understand the challenges that we had and the challenges that we have for marginalized students, um, social emotional learning. I'll give you an example. Uh, my son is in an IEP and a lot of the services he didn't have. I also have, you know, ins insurance that is good. So I have a lot of privilege that we're able to move him to separate um, private, private therapies for his physical and um, the speech therapy worked great and it was fantastic. But I'm just thinking of students like him that didn't get the services like I, you know, like that fully um, that they needed because of COVID, because of, of all of that. And parents like me that chose to go a different route because of all the limitations that we had. So how do how do we include those conversations around in 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 this? And then I'm also wondering about dropouts and if we have data around how many how many of our students just like of how many of our families just decided this was too much and I'm not gonna deal with it. So and so I know it's a lot of questions. So I guess like the question that I have is like what are the challenges and things that you like would like us to know when we're thinking about policies and when we're thinking about like all that it is in our plate um, around supporting the work, the amazing work that you're already doing. So our data, we didn't disaggregate the data for this particular presentation, um, but when that dis data is disaggregated, our students on IEPs are not proficient. The vast majority of them are not proficient. Um, and the board has seen that data from prior years. Uh, we just don't have it disaggregated this year because of, because of lots of things. <laughs> um, but that is an area that we're really talking about in terms of how do we better support our kids on IEPs uh, to, to help them reach proficiency. Um, the public comment this morning was there's, I can't deny any of that. We don't have a good transition program. That's something that we have talked about quite a, we've talked about every budget cycle um, since I've been superintendent is uh, do we put in a transition program? We've worked to try to work with our, with Washington Central um, around developing one together collaboratively um, because then financially it makes a little bit more sense. That gets really difficult when you're sharing staff between districts because who owns what, who does the evaluations? There's lots of questions that need to be worked out and Washington Central's had a lot of leadership changes, which doesn't help that conversation go forward. Um, but Renee can speak to that a little bit more too, but that's been something that we've named as a need, absolutely. Um, in terms of dropout, do you mean like the traditional high school dropout or do you mean families who went to home study or do you mean like what, I need to know more information about what you yeah. mean. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe families, with with a special ed that just like couldn't, you know, like just dropped out, just decided. I don't know. To... I don't know if we have that number, Mike or Renee. Do you? Do you have an or Katie? Not at the high school. You mean as far as this year? Yeah, Amanda. Yeah, yeah. No, none at the high school. Everybody was either virtual or in person. We've hired for this year in our virtual academy um, two virtual interventionists to help students, to pull students through this year because it, a lot of parents decided on VTVLC and VTVLC is a very different structure. Um, and a lot of kids, not a lot of kids, but there's a handful of kids, particularly middle school kids who had significant challenges, mostly with the executive functioning skills around organization, structuring their day, that kind of thing. Um, because really VTVLC needs a whole lot of home support um, if you're going to go that route for a lot of students, particularly when they're middle schoolers. 
Um, some some thrived in it, absolutely, but many struggled. So we hired two interventionists this year uh, that are virtual, who are virtual, have flex hours in order to um, support, well, three actually, because we have one at the high school too. Sorry, I wasn't thinking about him, um, to help support students and, and get them through. And I can think of one student right now who's really still struggling with that. Mike, do you have any, can you think of others? Yeah, I, I, there's not any particular um, subset or demographic that I would say has fallen into that, um, that we can identify. But at each grade level, we have a few students who have more needs. And so we've got systems in place to be able to support them in the virtual environment. Um, there's been some challenges around special education services in the virtual world because it's just a little different. It's, it's a little more challenging, but there's been some creative solutions that have come up, particularly in the K through six um, zone. Uh, but no, I, haven't, I don't recall anyone leaving it because of anything like that. And then um, one last question regarding uh, like BIPOC student, I know there were, you know, pre-COVID, were there BIPOC students and students uh, from the LGBTQ community and all the clubs, you know, like outright coming to have like the clubs and all of those clubs that existed before. Um, is Was that, you know, did that continue? Did that fall through? And did you see any impact on those students with marginalized identities that, you know, that had challenges not accessing those services or support systems pre-COVID? Because obviously because of of a pandemic? The clubs did continue. They continued in a virtual fashion. Um, I, I did have a conversation with Sylvia Fagan, who uh, works with the equity, or no, the um, GSA, thanks Renee, the GSA at the high school um, a month or so ago, and she said she didn't have a whole lot of participation, but they showed up, every, the advisor showed up every week to make sure that the kids had a space there. Um, Renee, can you speak to, if you know of any other um, need for support for those two groups of kids that you've noticed at the high school level? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that there's been lines of communication that, that it's always open, whether we are virtual or, or not in this environment or prior environments where, um, you know, information will go through maybe a social worker or a guidance counselor. And then that information will come through the admin team, possibly a club advisor if, if um, that student's a part of the club. Um, and we really just wrap our arms around that student and sometimes that family um, to support in whatever way is needed. And that looks different for every, every student. There, there definitely were a few students um, as a part of the LGBTQIA population um, who struggled this year. I think that there was more of a significant struggle in the spring last year when we were completely remote um, than it was this year being in person. And I can, I can tell you like our, our, our attendance is it's 98%, which is great, but I would guarantee that the attendance on Wednesdays when it was remote days was probably the most challenging for our students. Um, I know that for a fact. So I would imagine that back in the spring, um, when we were always fully remote, there was, there was an incredible amount of, um, concerns for our students, um, within the, the BIPOC, um, LGBTQI, um, and truthfully for, for many of our, our other students as well. So we didn't see it as much um, because we were in person this year and thankful that we had that opportunity. Oh, one more, one more. Just about the our yeah. English language learners and how communication, how you felt the communication um, was sufficient in terms of like all the COVID stuff. I think I can hold that off. I can send an email asking this question. Do want to answer? I thought she said she was going to hold it off. I can answer. Our EL teachers have an oh. English language blog oh, um, that take all the communication and they they pare it down a bit um, into simpler language. They've worked on that. Um, 
and I believe they take each each communication that goes home and they they put it into the blog in a different way and make sure that that's communicated out to families. Um, Emma's up. I do want to say we are more than 45 minutes past schedule. We have three items left on the agenda. We have a very long day tomorrow together. Um, so let's have Emma go uh, and then let's aim for extreme pithiness um, on the next three items if, if we can uh, so do that. Uh, Emma. All right, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> um, Thank you everybody and also echoing everybody's sort of like finger snapping and and celebration of a year that could have been so much harder if we weren't um, dealing with the dedicated community of professionals that we have and you've clearly shown us in your presentation a lot that we have a lot to celebrate and um, I was impressed with like no major academic setbacks and you had you chose to highlight the seventh and eighth grade math so i wanted to give a shout out to rebecca delora who's on the call right now she's um, one of the seventh and eighth grade math teachers and she's incredible and brilliant and patient and has been a really wonderful um, inspiration to my son in seventh and eighth grade he now wants to pursue a career in math already <laughs> so um you know i think this is really a lot of the celebrations in the presentation are a testament to um how dedicated and and incredibly talented our educating our educators are um on the other hand i feel like this is sort of a year of like yes and for me like yes there's a lot to celebrate and there's a lot that i am really worried about and and makes me sort of like you know makes my heart break a little bit <laughs> um so i want to be careful in some of the interpretations of the data just that we don't um try to make it half uh, glass half full all the time. It seemed like there was some that were um, interpreted as a sign of thriving, where I wasn't, um, you know, my personal interpretation was like, oh, but there's so much more to that story, like the reduced behavior incidences. And as Libby pointed out, some of the factors that contributed to those reduced behavior incidences were also sort of reasons why um, Julia Chaffetz's uh, testimony at the beginning resonated with me. It's like a lot of kids are really struggling in this environment where they are, you know, kept from socializing with their friends on the playground. And even though that might result in reduced behavior incidences, it's not necessarily a positive thing all the time. Um, and also the same thing with reduction in staff absences. It's a great thing. And it also makes me think that our incredibly dedicated teaching staff um, might have passed on some of their personal mental health days or professional development days in order to be in the classroom in a year when substitutes didn't really exist and that missed days were really a struggle. So I don't know if we really have time, but if there's any big like things that are sitting with um, our leaders here tonight, a yes and moment for you, like, yes, there are these silver linings. Yes, the glass can be seen as half full and there's also this other side to the story to tell. I'd like to hear some of those if you quickly. <laughs> Ryan. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%, Emma. And I think that there's, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the internalizing piece is something that I talked about a little bit. And I think that our data really shows that that's where kids are struggling. Um, it's the internal piece. So it's, they're not acting out and we're not seeing a lot of behavior incidents and big aggressive behaviors and, uh, physical altercations and things. We're not seeing that. Um, but our kids are, are pushing it all inside. And so there's a lot of that mental health, uh, you know, perspective that we really need to pay attention to. And Julia and I, Julia and I actually had a really in-depth conversation about that last week and how, um, as a state, Vermont, and I'm sure it's uh, like this all the way around the country, but how um, needed additional mental health services are for our students and for our families too, in general. Um, so I would say that's the big piece that I think we're in, you know, still in crisis level is around the mental health side. And that when we have a student that is at that, you know, nine out of 10 on concern level, 
we still can't get support for those students. And so when we're saying, you know, we want to reach out to local health agencies, we want to reach out to therapists, we want to reach out to all these people, we're having a really hard time accessing those supports. And so I think, you know, moving forward, that would be the area that, that uh, I think is, is one of, you know, needs to be a very primary focus for the whole community. Anybody else want to add, Renee? I agree. Um, I've just seen that um, in, in some scenarios this year, just as far as yes, if you want, yes. And um, the social isolation has certainly had significant um, challenges and, and created significant challenges for our students. And, you know, one of the beautiful things that came out of this year, everybody else got to, and I'll just share that other, that other thing that I want, we will carry over to next year was, um, being able to greet every student in the morning or in the afternoon when they walk through the doors um, and being able to make that connection with every student and just ask how are you doing today and you could just you can see like when they said i'm okay I'm like, yeah, are, you, are you okay and they would go into something else you know and just talk about yeah it was it's the same weekend we've had every other weekend or it was the same kind of vacation we've had every other kind of vacation sitting at home doing nothing so i think everything that ryan said is absolutely true um, it's something that we really have to pay attention to going into the next school year um, and how we um, support our students and quite honestly, how we support the adults as well. Um, so I uh, uh, jump on board with Ryan, what Brian had, had shared. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for that. Um, I really do want to, again, applaud the great, the great work. Um, uh, I definitely agree with the caution that Emma put put on on it, but um, I also, you know, I, I work with with colleagues whose seventeen year olds have barely left their apartment, you know, all this year in New York City. Um, I think what we were able to do was was quite remarkable, um, and and I'm glad we have some lessons we can build on. Um, uh, let's move on to, and I'm sure you're all happy to get back to your your. Uh, Evening, so um, the administrative team can hop off if they want. Um, we're uh, moving on to uh, board discussion climate survey, and I don't know who wants to take the lead on this. Probably Andrew. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Mia and Amanda take the lead on on this because they've been working on developing the demographics questions and. I was really acting as a reviewer and then I just the you know I we we all thought that this proposal should come to the board before I moved forward with engaging with the teachers about um, developing this survey so I think the general proposal before the board is really me and Amanda's so please take it away Amanda do you want to start go ahead Mia um, well, I guess, especially for the interest of time, I think it's, we're hoping that everybody had a chance to read the, the overview, which um, mostly contained the, the draft questions, draft demographic questions, um, but there at the bottom, one of the things that we came to realize as we were thinking through the questions was that we really wanted to make sure that teachers would feel um, as open as we need them to in order to be honest about where things are at within the climate of their own their buildings. Um, and so that's where the proposal for the reporting came from where um, we would certainly share all the demographic data just the straight up this is what the demographics of our workforce look like. Um, publicly, we think it's a really important benchmark for everybody to be in on and then we would um, not disaggregate data when it came to here's what um, teachers have to say about what they're experiencing in their buildings. Um, and, and that that um, in this proposal is that the equity committee of the board would be the one to see all that and then summarize it and present it to the board and the administration. Um, but another idea that we had was that we could also certainly hire um, a, a consultant or a vendor to facilitate the survey itself and be the one that um, sees the raw data and does the summarizing for us. So those are two ideas that we um, had. And, and basically what we wanted to make sure is that this board was all on the same page before Andrew goes to the teachers and says, this is 
these are the questions that we would like to include in the survey and here's what we're thinking about for um, how we will report the information. And then as part of what Andrew will do is also invite the teachers to participate in designing the survey with us. I think that covers. Yeah, it. yeah, I, I think that's that's great. There's, I just wanna make sure it's clear for everybody a couple of things. There, there is um, a field here that is prefer not to answer as well, which I thought, you know, that, that was a very, um, you know, sensitive thing that you included as, as well. And Amanda gets all the credit for making the questions as robust as they are. I took it from a report, so. <laughs> and, a about this, so. and really, you know, when, when we looked at this, the, the charge is the board will conduct an annual staff survey. The annual survey will include questions about safety, school culture, and achievement of district goals. Um, a summary and board reflection will be provided to staff in a timely manner. And when I think about our equity policy and I think about school safety, school culture, and achievement of district goals, I do think that these demographic questions are really important for us to understand our, our safety, culture, and achievement of district goals. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I think you you guys, I think this is a thoughtful proposal. I'm curious. To know if the board, if Libby, what what you all think, if you have any concerns, um, if you have any approaches that you'd like tweaked here. Um, any any thoughts on what they put forward? I thought it was uh, pretty pretty well thought out, Jill. Yeah, thanks. And can I just confirm that these would be demographic questions that would be included in a larger culture or? Uh, staff survey about the safety school culture and achievement district goals right these are this isn't the entirety of what we're proposing in the survey this is a, a portion of the questions that we're trying to get at okay and then um yeah i think it's fantastic i think it would be really helpful to inform the recruitment and and a lot of other things i am still worried about um libby's caution from our um legal folks in the union about asking them and i don't know if there's a way around that if the board asks it directly but i, I didn't want to ignore that that caution that we had received before thanks um emma i guess i just i wasn't sure if we had already run these questions by the union and if there was a conversation back and forth with them yet about that okay we wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page before we proceeded. And and these actually, I have a question that I don't think was covered in in your memo, Mia. And I apologize if it was, and I just missed it. the The survey will be done anonymously by teachers, correct? And and so you'll have individual responses when you're talking about raw data, but you're not going to have individual teachers' names. the The whole idea here is that for um, certain marginalized and my minority um, teach, teachers who, who are representative of marginalized and minority um, populations that even without their names, you might be able to glean who a person is. And that's why this extra measure is being proposed. And we thought that instead of just going to the teachers with these questions, also providing an approach that was sensitive to their um, to the concerns that we understood they had um, would be helpful. And you know, they might the teachers might come back after they discuss this, and they might want us to tweak this, or they might have some concerns that we haven't considered. So um, we figured, Emma, we figured we should kind of vet it as a board and and with Libby first before moving forward. I guess we're proposing two things. One is that do we all agree on the set of data questions that are framed in the document that we developed? And the second question is to, before we went to speak or Andrew went to speak with the uh, union team that um, there was a conversation that 
one of the concerns is about identifying someone who identifies with a marginalized identity that might want to share, that might not want to share because is doesn't want to be upfront with the administration because this, this is a culture um, document about the culture of our district uh, climate survey, climate culture. So the idea is that the equity team will pull and desegregate that data to ensure that the report that goes out doesn't identify any one teacher because we know that the staff that we have is limited so in terms of some of the identities that are visible and identifiable. So is our proposal to, to um, collect the, this uh, data are the equity committee collecting this data and then summarizing it um, and giving that to the district or administration along with the other questions um, or along with the other data, but that wouldn't be summarized. So that would be raw data given to administration. Only this, these particular questions would be summarized or um, uh, um, collated and given to the administration to prevent. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question about timing, um, just out of curiosity. Uh, this needs to be, uh, as I understand, this needs, this is a, a, a requirement, right? To, to give the, 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 uh, these, this question or whatever, um, before the school year ends, what's the timing about that? Like, what's the process? If we had, if we had to give this to the, um, to, to the teachers union and they coming back and then, you know, making changes, going back and forth and then including it and then adding, and then sending out the survey. How are we it, with the time? It's, well, it's, it's the teachers is June 14th. Uh, so you can't send anything after June 14th. Okay. Yeah, so ideally we'd, we'd get it done this month. Ultimately, you know, in, in the past, and we talked about this before, the board hasn't put much thought into this, frankly. Um, it hasn't, this is, this is, this is an opportunity and, um, you know, putting the thought in now and the time and energy in now is going to be, we think is going to be helpful to the board, to the administration, to the teachers. It, it's an opportunity to, to, to gain some meaningful insights into what our educators are thinking and how they're feeling. Um, so yeah, I do understand what you're saying, Anakit, which is we need to get the ball rolling. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just curious about, you know, how, how much time do we have to put in this and, and, you know, what are we looking at? Just just out of curiosity. So I, it, it looks like if we have till June 14, we do have some time, but there is obviously urgency going back and forth with the union. If, you know, if you're proposing something and they don't agree with it and they come back with saying, no, we don't agree with this. We figure this needs to be, this needs yeah. to happen this way and, and that kind of stuff. So, so is the committee, um, are we authorizing the committee to, to um, go ahead and do that? Or do we have to wait till the next board meeting to come back and say, okay, this is what they've come back with and what do we do with that? I, I mean, I, I would say that the idea is that Andrew gets to negotiate with the union how the, the, the full climate survey, which we need to do anyways. And then this part might be the one that it's, I mean, if they say no, there's not much we can do, right? For this year in terms of negotiating that, I think that that needs to be then talked about, but. Yeah, and I don't think we have to approve this specific thing. Um, I don't think they required us to do that, but I, I do know that, 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 that Armand and me and, and Andrew wanted to kind of get our, our blessing. I mean, we, we could approve it. Uh, and just in terms of timing, we really only have. I think if we don't if we don't get this wrapped up by early June, you know, we want to give the teachers some time to respond. So, um, so, so what I think. Yeah, has her hand up too. But go oh, ahead, sorry. Andrew. Mia, why don't you go first? I was just going to say that the. I mean, I don't know that if this is splitting hairs or if it actually matters, but the the language in the contract with the teachers is that we will conduct an annual survey. It doesn't actually say we have to send it by the end of the school year. Um, I, I would really appreciate us being like aiming for that deadline because I'd like to gather the information from teachers for how it's been this year. 
And if we wait until next year, then we're going to have new teachers who can't really answer that question from this year. Anyway, uh, but I just want I just wanted to point that out because I agree that us putting thoughtfulness and or, you know inclusiveness into this process now gives us a tool that we can really just continue to use year after year and not have to do this conversation year after year. Remember, Mia, you're working with school years, not not regular years. So the year is over June 30th. Um, and teachers stop working June 14th. So when it says annual on the contract, the meaning is the school year. So, okay. It's so not, I was splitting hairs in a not so helpful way. Annual. Yeah, it's, it's the yeah. school year. Okay. So, I mean, if everybody's all right with this, uh, I think in, in terms of, well, let me ask Mia and Amanda, in terms of the survey itself, in addition to these questions, um, were there, I, I know Emma had proposed something do we have a draft survey ready to go? Because what I could do is when I reach out to Chris, um, and I know Chris is wrapping up his time um, with our district as well. Uh, when I reach out to him, um, if I have a survey in hand, I say, hey, here's here's something for you to take. Here's something tangible. Here's here's what we'd like to send out. Let us know if you guys want to alter this, what, what you think about this, um, if you have any concerns about uh, the demographics component, then they'll have everything right there. That'll probably streamline this back and forth. Um, so in terms of fleshing out a draft, an entire draft survey to send them, do you think we're about there? What was shared in the packet, it doesn't have all the information that I know the teachers want. So the so idea that we want, I wanted to ask that to the teachers is like, what do they want? At least some of them. The intent so. behind that language in the contract was, was put in place. I found out the history of it was put in place in 2016-17 negotiations. And it was at a point in time that teachers did not feel that they had a whole lot of voice in what was happening in the district. Um, and they didn't have a whole lot of collaboration with administration, they felt. So they, that's why they wanted that survey so that that information be, could become data points that we could act on. Um, and so that's the history of it. Um, and so the, the teachers I know based on feedback and what they've told me in the last couple of days is that um, the climate survey that they are looking for is yes, some of the ideas that were in the board packet and also conversation about communication with administration and participation in 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 in, in the work of the district um, and participation in making decisions and that kind of thing that was important to them at the time of that language in the contract and it's still important to them um, and it's important to our administration because we we try and strive to be as collaborative and as communicative as we can with our teaching force so um so that, those are the pieces that are missing from what I could see. But the teachers will be able to tell you that quite, quite readily themselves too. So, so what I, what, when we ask the teachers for their input, the thing is, Amanda, if we reach out to the teachers who are at the end of a very long year, and I know because I'm married to one, um, and uh, if we don't give them something tangible to respond to, First of all, if we give them something tangible to respond to, they can tell us what they want to change, what they want to add. But if we don't give them anything, then we're just delaying this process further, which we don't have much time. Yeah, so just to be clear, we have not developed any of the other questions. We just copy and paste from the Libby um, survey. The PBIS one. The PBIS. the PBIS one from two years ago, yeah. So that's what we copy and paste. We have not even thought about that. We just spend a lot of our time thinking and researching some of this demographic data. So I'll be happy, I don't know Mia how your time is. I, I, I'll be happy to work with you in developing and you know mixing some, if Emma had ideas, any of the board that you have questions that you would like to be included, we can include it, we can send them to Andrew and then we can go from there and then that way you have that. Um, so I don't know me how your timing is. I can put some time this weekend. Um, I cannot do it before the weekend. <laughs> I can do it. Uh, yeah, for sure. The weekend. 
Are there elements of that former survey that we want to retain? Yeah, probably. Prob yeah. And then it sounds like maybe it's additional questions or some replacement ones, but why don't we put our heads together and see what we can find? And I think then it probably makes sense that, or maybe, you know, I guess this is a question, would the board like to see the full draft survey before taking it to the teachers? Um, or is this the demographic piece and the reporting, the, the hotter topics that we wanna make sure we have full board sort of acknowledgement and consensus before going to the teachers? Could that be something that we just give feedback on and that we don't have to approve by a vote at a board meeting? Like we just can give feedback? Yeah, or we could just include it in the packet and see if we want to give feedback, we might be okay with it. But why don't we, uh, yeah, I think it's worth at least having us take a look at it. Okay. So have, so I was more we would be waiting like, till the next board meeting. Right, I was more thinking like if we want to speed the process along a little bit, that well, between before the next board meeting that we would be able to give feedback without having to like vote on it, like give the committee the authority to create the survey that they're bringing to the to the union, but that we would have an opportunity between now and the next meeting, whenever that happens, to give feedback individually. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think as long as we don't do joint editing. What? But you can as long as we don't question. do joint editing on a document, I think we could all give individual feedback to an appointed member. Okay. Yeah, so why don't if you if you have um, ideas or things that you think would help with this, and I know Emma, you you do and, and did, and I shared that with me and Amanda. Um, please just send it to me and Amanda. It sounds like Mia and Amanda, you guys can meet this weekend to go over this, and I sure. could free up time Sunday like evening if that would be good, or Monday evening or something if you want to go through things. Um, one last time, and then we can get something over to the teachers for their consideration early next week. Does that sound like a reasonable plan? Yeah. I guess I'd like to see the draft before you take it to the teachers. I'd like to have an opportunity to give feedback before you take it to the teachers. So, okay, we can, we can do that. We could do it at the following. It's just at a, at a certain point in time, Emma, we're going to run out of, we're going to run out of time. So the next time would be able to do that um, would be the retreat next Thursday, which we, is already a very full agenda. So, well, no, Andrew, Andrew, Jim just confirmed that people could look at the draft, the Google doc, and then just email Amanda or just email me like, oh, I see on line 17, there's a typo, or even I disagree with question 17. And then Amanda and I could huddle on that what we get over email. So we wouldn't have to do it at uh, the retreat next Thursday or at the following board meeting. We could gather that stuff. As long as it's, as Jim just said, we're not co-editing a document. So then we, we'll make sure that we have feedback from everybody. Andrew brings it to the union, negotiates, and then it goes yeah. to approval for the full, before we send it out to, to the staff. Yeah, I was just thinking what I what I misinterpreted. I thought what Emma was saying is she'd like for us to bring it back to the board. And I was like, well, we're gonna have to, okay. Nope. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, excellent. Thank you both for um, all your work on this. Yeah, no, thank you for all the work on this. Um, I thought the, the way it was laid out was very thoughtful. Uh, the policy uh, monitoring reports, um, we have two, uh, fiscal management and budget execution. Um, do I have a motion to approve those? And then after the motion, we can we can discuss them if there's questions um, or comments. Um, we have a motion to reject the policy monitoring reports. Do I have a motion to approve or reject the policy monitoring reports? Um, I move that we accept policy monitoring reports E01 and E02, fiscal management and budget execution. Uh, second. No, second. Um, any discussion? I have a question. What is the limitation 
Um, what is that? I'm sorry, I'm trying to look this up. Um, there's a reference to some limitation that needs to be removed um, in these reports. Sorry, Annika, I didn't have them pulled up. I'm like <laughs> trying to pull them up right now. Hold on one second. <laughs> Which one is that, Annika? Um, so the limitations policy 2.3 and the 2.6, I'm looking at a uh, policy monitoring report for EO2 and yep. the, in the compliance, the first one itself, it says the uh, budget execution goal number four mentions limitations policy 2.3 and that should be removed. I believe that's an old policy. So that doesn't even exist, is that what it is? Right. So there was a limitations policy somewhere? Jim, do you remember? Um, I think I think that was I think that was a vestige from the old, the old board that didn't get cleaned up properly. I think most of your comments are vestiges from the previous Montpelier board that didn't properly get. Yeah, that's what Grant heard. referenced when he because Grant was the one who really dug into these so. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too, that they're they're based on old policy that we no longer have when we merged. Yeah, yeah and we, we used to have, you know, relationships with the city and some other other issues that just aren't relevant anymore. Um, yeah. Um, same same um, monitoring report, then just not number six, a little bit further down. I just this is more of a curiosity. It's a it reads here. The previous superintendent approved the January 2018 version. Um, and I'm just curious about that language because it's not what superintendents do is approve policy. Um, where, are, if, where are you, Mia? You're on EO number two. six, the, the very bottom of your report on EO2, number six, one, six, one. Travel re, re no, sorry, not six, one, just six. EO2 was updated as of January 2018 and posted on the business office webpage. But subsequently removed, and then the previous superintendent approved the January 2018 version. So I'm just curious what wow. that. So so I was hired June 2018. Um, I'm not sure what that language was. I can check back with Grant, or but from what I'm reading, it looks like the previous superintendent. Um, it may not have come to the board. Um, and he, because it says- And got posted sure, or something? Yeah, we're not sure why it wasn't fully vetted and recognized from the board. Knowing Grant, he looked back to the um, agendas because we have all of them still from, from then. Um, so I'm guessing that it got, I see. it got put on some sort of website or official notice and it, it didn't go through the proper channels with the board. But I'm guessing gotcha. on that as I wasn't the superintendent at the time. Okay. Jill. And I think what these edits, I appreciate Anke and me raising these. I think these are edits that are supposed to now go to the policy committee to update the policies. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, the, the policy committee needs to, to fix these. Um, sure. uh, other comments and or questions? Um, let's move to a vote then. Uh, Anakin. Aye. Uh, Kristen. Aye. Jill. Aye. Mia. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Andrew. Aye. <laughs> Did it not come through before? <laughs> huh? Oh. No. Weird. Uh, you stared somewhat catatonically at your screen. Uh, Jerry. Hi. Uh, Amanda. Yay. And Emma. Hi. I'm saving the yay for adjournment. Um, uh, do I have a motion to move into executive session for the purpose of uh, personnel uh, matters? So moved. 
Do I have a second? I second. Uh, Anakit? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Jill? Aye. Mia? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Amanda? Yay. Uh, and Emma? Aye. Okay, great. Um, I think we need a, a breakout room.